Good morning to all of you here joining online. My name is Evelyn Kasuga. I'm chair of the board of Arizona Town Hall. And on behalf of the board of directors, our president, Tara Jackson and her team, and the many, many town hall volunteers throughout Arizona, we are delighted to welcome you to this inaugural background report launch event. For those of you new to Arizona Town Hall, we are an Arizona-based nonprofit. And as Tara often likes to say, we are a uh, multi-partisan organization that educates, encourages, uh, connects, and empowers Arizonans to resolve important issues through consensus using a process based on respectful dialogue that values diverse perspectives, builds relationships, and fosters leadership development. And we've been doing this now for over 60 years. Thank you so much for joining us. Our topic this year, mental health, substance use, and homelessness touches individuals, communities, and all of us in some way. The background report, which can be found on our website and the panel of experts you'll hear from today, provide a unique resource. Throughout 2022, Arizona Town Hall participants, and hopefully many of you who are listening today will be engaging more deeply on the topic in your own communities with a culminating event, a statewide one, sometime in November on how best to address these intersecting issues. I now have the honor to introduce my friend, Shelly Mellon, who is representing the Southwest Arizona Town Hall and our program host. Shelly, take it Thank away. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Good morning. It's a, another beautiful day in Arizona. And on behalf of the Southwest Arizona Town Hall, we re uh, represent Yuma County. We welcome you to Arizona Town Hall's Mental Health, Substance Use, and Homelessness Report Launch. We are extremely grateful for our relationship and our partnership with Arizona Town Hall. We've been fortunate to collaborate on many successful community enhancing town halls and forums. I do wanna make sure you mark your calendars for our upcoming Southwest Arizona Town Hall foundational forums. May 20th is our virtual mental health forum in partnership with Yuma Regional Medical Center. June 10th is our virtual substance use forum in partnership with the Yuma County Anti-Drug Coalition and Drug-Free Communities. And September 30th, hopefully is our in-person mental health, substance use and homelessness town hall. I truly believe our town halls are the backbone to the vitality, progress and future of Arizona and its remarkable communities. Thank you everyone for joining us together, um, being with us today and for investing your most precious gifts, which are your time and your insight. And I would also like to express a huge heartfelt thank you to the renowned Morrison Institute for the incredible work to marshal all these extraordinary authors and for the immense amount of time it takes um, and their expertise to edit the background report. Now it's my extreme honor and pleasure to introduce to you Christy Eustace, Senior Research Analyst for the Morrison Institute and the editor for this report. Christy. Thank you, Shelley. Hello, my name is Christy Eustace. I'm a senior research analyst at Morrison Institute, and I was one of the 2022 Town Hall Report editors. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Morrison is a nonpartisan public policy research center. We are located in Watts, uh, Arizona State University's Watts College for Public Service and Community Solutions. As an institute, we analyze important policy issues to advance public understanding in, um, in Arizona and beyond. Um, we develop tools and resources that help communities make informed decisions, and we provide forums to engage with public policy research. So today, I'm really here just to set the stage for our wonderful panelists by providing an overview, brief overview of the report, including why this topic was chosen, um, our kind of intent and approach to editing and compiling the report, and the overall report structure. Okay. So mental health, substance use, and homelessness was selected by the Town Hall Research Committee as the report topic because of the challenges and broad sweeping impacts that are associated with the intersection of these issues. So according to the 2020 point in time count, there were nearly 11,000 people experiencing homelessness in Arizona. Of these, 1,863 people had chronic substance use, 
and 1,718 were designated as having a serious mental illness. It's also important to note that these numbers are undercounts, given that the point in time count is conducted on one single day a year by volunteers. Also, this number doesn't include people who are marginally housed. So those are folks who are maybe living with family or in substandard conditions. Adding these individuals propels this estimate to nearly 44,000. That is well over twice the number of people it takes to fill the Phoenix Suns arena. Moreover, the effects of these issues ripple across our communities and our neighborhoods and impact more than the individual who's experiencing them. There are impacts on the health and social service systems, emergency systems, uh, and the criminal justice system, as well as on local economies and public spaces. Then there are the mental and emotional tolls for the individual and their support network, as well as the financial consequences for families, communities, cities, and the state. In some, this topic was chosen for its relevance because these issues and their intersection in one way or another are likely to touch all Arizonans. So approaching the report, there was really a collective effort to produce a document that is focused, uh, fact-based, descriptive, and representative. Focus meaning that to the extent possible, content is focused on that unique intersection of mental illness, substance use, and homelessness. Fact-based, meaning content is supported by data and literature and or grounded in an author's lived or professional experience. Um, we encourage authors to include their experience knowledge, not only because it's extremely valuable, but often it's the only information available. Descriptive, the content explains the issue and doesn't advocate for one particular position or approach. And representative, the report includes statewide data and perspectives. So authors are experts from various service delivery organizations, government agencies, and academic institutions from across the state, including rural Arizona. So this last slide provides a snapshot of the report content and structure. Uh, the complexity of this topic resulted in a lengthy report, I'm sure you've seen. Uh, because of this, we crafted an introduction that is intended to give readers kind of a preview of the report while also providing some base level of information about the issues. Uh, there are also cross references throughout the report to help readers navigate to specific information that they're interested in or looking for. The report begins with a comprehensive overview of mental illness, substance use, and homelessness in their intersection. Authors then provide an overview of integrated treatment and care in Arizona, structural factors that produce and perpetuate these issues, and options for recovery and stabilization. The report concludes with 10 spotlight chapters focusing on specific subpopulations who are disproportionately and or uniquely impacted by the intersection of mental illness, substance use, and homelessness. Um, although, these, although we know these issues can and, and do impact anyone, we also recognize that not all people are impacted equally or the same way. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, for, your, and for your interest in this topic. We hope that you will explore the report and participate in both the statewide and community town halls um, this fall. Lastly, I just want to extend, oh, sorry, I don't have our panelists up there. There we go. Um, I wanna extend a sincere thank you to the report authors for contributing their expertise, time and energy towards this critical topic and resource. Um, we, we obviously could not have put together this resource without them, so thank you. And at this point, I will we'll hand the program back over to Evelyn. Great. Um, thank you, Christy and Morrison Institute. We are ever grateful for your ongoing support and partnership as we collectively create those solutions to, to those most challenging issues facing our communities and our state. And we have a number of generous uh, sponsors um, and to name a couple specific to this event. First of all, as you've already heard, from, uh, from Shelly, we also have the Southwest Arizona Town Hall who has been a longtime collaborator and is our program host today. And we also want to thank the Giesel Firm, fiscal sponsor for the background report launch events. We had one in Phoenix yesterday, we have one here with you today, and we also have one um, in Flagstaff later on this month. I'm also pleased to announce that we've just learned, and thanks to and thanks to the generous investment from the Diane and Bruce Holly Foundation, Arizona Town Hall will be able to support more community and future leader town halls on this topic throughout Arizona. So um, 
uh, if you after you hear from our panel of experts, be sure to count, contact us if you'd like to bring a town hall to your community. As Shelly said, there's already going to be one in Yuma, but there may be others of you from other parts of the state joining today. So I'd like to move ahead with introducing our esteemed panel members whose bios you can find on our website. So uh, to, to keep us on track, we have today Shelly Silver, Deputy Director of Health Plan Operations for Arizona Healthcare Cost and Containment System, also known as ACCESS. We have Amy St. Peter, Deputy Executive Director for Maricopa Association of Governments. We have Cindy Stotler, Deputy Director of the Arizona Department of Housing, and Aaron Balos, Conciliation Court Mediator for the Superior Court. And serving as our panel moderator, please welcome the Honorable Judge Pat Norris, retired, who is the immediate past chair of Arizona Town Hall and current chair of our research committee. Pat, it's all yours. Well, Evelyn, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. We are going to try and make this interactive and fun with respect to a very difficult topic. So uh, a couple of things. I would encourage you to please ask questions. Most of you should, depending on your equipment, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see an icon that says Q&A. That's a question and answer box. So if you would put your questions in that uh, uh, question box, what I will do is try to multitask and look at your questions and ask your questions. I'll be your voice today. Ask your questions to our, our panel. Uh, and uh, so if you if you have any difficulties, let us know. But I think that will help you become engaged in this topic. This is a very significant topic. Uh, the report, I have the first page. I hope you can see it. It is fabulous. Um, Christy and her colleagues at Morrison uh, have outdone themselves in preparing an exhaustive report that addresses most, if not all, of the facets of mental health, substance use, and homelessness. And so uh, this is bookend to that to those causes and how they interact with homelessness. Uh, so I would ask, since we have a panel that we know each other and we work well together. I'm going to encourage our panelists to unmute themselves, something very unzoom like. So go ahead and unmute yourselves. And then I'm going to tee off a few questions, hoping that our uh, members of the webinar will ask questions as well. And just raise a real hand and I can see it and I'll call on you and we can have as close to a realistic interactive discussion as possible. So again, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for participating. As Christy mentioned, the topic of this report is mental health, substance use, and homelessness. To start our discussion off, why is it important to consider these three areas? Because we know that homelessness is caused by many other factors, but we're focusing on really substance use, mental health, as they intersect with homelessness. So why are we focusing on these three for this report? Why is it important for us to do so? Yes, Amy, thanks for uh, uh, leading us off and then I'm gonna call on Shelly. Great, thanks so much, Pat. Yeah, I think that's a really important question and one that can help to ground this whole conversation. Um, from my perspective, these three issues in particular are so fully intertwined and that happens on the front end as well as on the back end. So on the front end, well, Mental health issues and substance use issues may not independently cause someone to experience homelessness. Often they do contribute to that experience. And even if someone isn't already experiencing those issues, after they are experiencing homelessness, they may actually start to experience substance use issues and mental health issues as well in response to the trauma that they suffer as a result of not having a home. And so they may, um, their mental health may, may significantly suffer and then they'll acquire those mental health issues. They may also self-medicate by using the substances as well. So it can occur throughout the whole process, but particularly on the front end and the back end. So it's critically important then to, to acknowledge that, 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 that relationship and then to be able to address these, these three issues together in a really holistic manner because fractured systems will result in a fractured care. And fractured care prolongs the trauma and the cost paid by individuals, by communities, by agencies, 
by the systems of care as well. So it's critically important to recognize that these three issues are intertwined and then to develop an appropriate response in light of that recognition. Mm-hmm. Shelley? Thanks, Pat. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that there is a strong correlation between homelessness and morbidity and mortality. We know that there is a very high prevalence of mental health issues and substance use um, among, as well as infectious diseases among um, the homeless population. In fact, I would put forth that the fourth word that goes in, in that um, pairing of words, mental health, substance use, homelessness, and Medicaid, in, in our case, access. Um, we did um, some analysis of our own data and that data showed that 75%, and I'm, I'm reading some, I'm che- cheating here and reading a statistic, 75% of access members experiencing homelessness had at least one claim related to substance use, 75%, three quarters. When we narrow down the population of our members identified as homeless, to just those who have a designation of serious mental illness, 80, 89% of, that, of those members also received a substance use service. A startling statistic is that the average annual cost for these members, so members who are homeless, who are designated seriously mentally ill, the average annual cost is about $67,000 compare that to the average annual cost of an access enrollee overall, not homeless, not seriously mentally ill, Mm $7,000, $7,000 compared to $67,000, very significant. And we know, of course, obviously money, money's not the, the, the only important factor here. Of course, it's a, it's a proxy for the, the health disparity of these members. On this point, because yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, we had a pro- this program in Phoenix, a large urban area. We're now dealing and talking about a more um, focused approach, which is we're in Yuma. Do you see members of the panel, any differences in what you've just discussed relating to uh, a large urban area? versus a smaller urban area surrounded by rural and, um, uh, or for example, in our tribal areas uh, farther out from Yuma. Do you see any difference? Or are these same intersections and these same, as Amy said, front end and back end, still the same, no matter where we as Arizonans are living? Amy, you're nodding, and then Cindy has something. Yeah. Great, Cindy? Thank you. Oh, Amy, you go ahead, then Cindy. Oh, no, it's okay. Cindy, you go ahead. No, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll say we are um, we are the um, funder for the continuum of care in the balance of state. Mm-hmm. So we work with the balance of state rural communities all the time and their local coalitions to end homelessness. And we have uh, pretty much the same issues with seriously mentally ill and substance abuse mm-hmm. persons who are homeless. It's just a different um atmosphere and a different um, service level in the rural communities that um, we, you know, need to put different efforts into, um, you know, finding transportation to get to services, um, creating more uh, shelter units and creating more drop-in centers for people to come and get services and be identified. And um, there's a lot more um, different types of outreach, especially in the northern um, section of the state where they people are camping and people are located on forest service lands and things like that. So um, it's just, I don't have a solution, but it is um, very, very different because the services are so scattered and the people are so scattered that, you know, we have to work harder to, to you know, connect people to services and keep them housed and get them housed in the first place, but keep them housed as well, because that, that ability to find services and, and connect and, and get to services is very difficult. Mm. Amy? Absolutely. We find often that the needs are universal. People have the same needs no matter where they live, but the resources are not universally accessible. And that really creates that, that need for a community-driven approach because the solutions need to be custom tailored to that community. So that's why it's so critically important to have the community drive the development of those solutions to ensure that the people receiving services are represented among those designing those solutions. 
because we find that every community has different strengths and needs, just like we as individuals have different strengths and challenges as well. And so there isn't just one group or one community, that's the strong community, that's the strong person, or that's the weak community, or that's the weak person. It's more a matter of how do we acknowledge our strengths um, and embrace them to address the challenges that we might have. So for example, in more rural areas, we find that they are more often under-resourced, but they often have a stronger social fabric. And that's a real <laughs> benefit, a real asset that, that can be leveraged, particularly when you're developing those, the, those solutions. We find that in the urban areas, the scale is so much bigger. So they might have more resources, but, they, but the scale of need is also bigger in terms of you know, dollars and numbers of people. In the tribal communities, I think it's critically important to acknowledge that there are different funding structures and there are different, at times, different social structures as well. And, so, and, and that makes it really important to have that, that Native nation drive the development of those priorities and, those, and the solutions in response to those priorities. And for us to acknowledge too that previous broken promises can contribute to an element of mistrust currently. We need to be authentic about that and we need to address it. And then we need to um, reinforce with any community, every community, that they're the ones driving the development of those solutions because it, while the needs are universal, the resources are not. And so we need to acknowledge that in the development of responsive Shelly. solutions. Yeah. You know, know. Amy, just, Amy just said something that struck a memory for me. Um, you know, we talked quite a bit yesterday about, uh, and, and Cindy and Amy both talked about how, you know, all these different communities in our state, our 15 counties, even within our counties mm -hmm. are, are very different. The fabric and makeup is very different. We have such a high, um, a percentage of federally owned land. Um, but, but something Amy just said struck a, a chord for me, you know, Access Runs a tribal program. We've got, uh, at the risk of getting it wrong, I think about 230,000 perhaps um, tribal members that we serve through a fee-for-service yeah. program. And well, 230,000, I think tribal members and about 150,000 we serve through a, a fee-for-service program. And I remember talking with one of my staff one time about housing and um, the comment and the cult cultural sensitivity and cultural appropriateness is, the, is where I'm going. And she uh -huh. talked to me about how, particularly in the tribal community that she's a part of, caring for one's elders is, is ingrained in her culture and the idea of having to, um, place somebody, whether it's a treatment facility or a homeless shelter mm -hmm. or some type of housing away from the family um, would not be uh, appropriate. Um, and so it just, it just adds and emphasizes Amy's comments of the challenges of the unique needs of each community, really having to come together to drive the solution because it's not a one size fits all solution. Uh, every community has to manage through what's appropriate to their culture and, and their infrastructure, lack of infrastructure. Maybe. Now, you segued nicely into a question I was going to ask you that you really started to address, which is whether effective solutions vary from community to community. And I think the answer is, you bet they sure do. On this point, um, and I'm thinking now specifically of, Yuma County and Yuma, San Luis, and the surrounding area. Do you have any thoughts on what you've seen from your experience ha have been effective solutions or approaches to addressing homelessness and mental health in that area of our state or in those communities? Amy, please. Um, so two thoughts on that. One is more um, kind of a tactical and the other is maybe a bit more esoteric. In terms of the tactical one, um, outreach teams I think are absolutely essential because so often we'll hear from, from, from people who are wanting to help or seeing the need to respond to homelessness. Um, and they'll say, well, but they just say, no, they don't want help. Okay. And what's underneath that is there are very valid reasons why somebody might say no. And it's because of the trauma that they've incurred. It's a lack of trust. Um, it's any number of different reasons. The outreach teams are key to breaking through that resistance or what's perceived as resistance and helping them to engage in services. And particularly looking at how do, how do they engage in mental health services, substance use services, to get them into housing. Those outreach teams are absolutely a critical component 
to making that transition with someone who's, who's um, maybe actively suffering from any one of those three elements. Um, so I think outreach teams across the board are really important. And it's really important to be able to coordinate among the different outreach teams to make sure that um, we're not leaving gaps in coverage in, in the community, and also to help each team learn from the other to bend each other's learning curve. So I think the more that we can have outreach teams, the more we can coordinate with the outreach teams, the better. The other one that's a bit more esoteric, but, not, but, mm -hmm. but nonetheless important, I think is to remove that us versus them mentality, that we're all in this together. We're all in this together as people, as communities, as agencies, as systems of care. And the more that we can work together, the better we'll be able to achieve all of our collective goals and achieve that more collective impact. So if we can um, promote this idea of we're all in this together, and how do we remove um, any barriers to that occurring, then I think we all succeed better. On the point, uh, and, and, and this would be something I think, uh, if you're a part of an outreach team, we have a question from our participants. Can we be, or can anyone around the room be more specific about the predominant mental health issues that are being found in homelessness? I mean, as I see the, or read that question, I'm thinking, is it, schizophrenia? Is it um, uh, mental health uh, issues caused by substance abuse? Um, are there some maybe some um, commonalities that we are seeing in our mental health issues that people are experiencing uh, when it comes to homelessness? And there you hear Max the dog going off. So I'm going to mute myself while Max settles down. I think it's the mailman. So any, 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 any more specificity on the predominant mental health issues that we're seeing as it relates to homelessness? Not, not that I, certainly not that I have with me today, but I don't know that we would even have that level of detail. I mean, we certainly know serious mental illness designation. We have that statistic, but I don't know that we have the exact mental illness cause. We, we may not have exact mental illness. Let me pick on Aaron, who is the program manager of the Yuma, uh, Superior Court of Yuma County. And that title really doesn't do her justice because within her portfolio, she works with Veterans Court, Mental Health Court, and Conciliation Services for people who are going through a dissolution or another type of separation. Aaron, from your experience, do you see any, maybe not statistical, but just some general trends of the type of mental illnesses you're seeing when it comes to homelessness? Well, I agree with um, Shelley that um, in our mental health court program, mm -hmm. um, they've been determined to be seriously mentally ill. Um, and we have a high percentage of uh, mental health clients coming into our program that are homeless. Um, and, you know, we've seen just an increase in the numbers. Um, and I can, uh, I can go talk about our drug court program as well. So our drug court program is for those who are suffering, you know, from a substance use disorder. And it's been in existence for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have seen an increase in those coming into our program for drug court that have both mental health issues and substance use issues. I can say in our veterans treatment courts, our drug court program and our mental health court program, there is not one person that just has a substance use disorder. There's not one person that only has a mental health issue. Clients are coming in with mental health and substance use issues at a higher rate, um, which, which we know um, homelessness intersects with that as well. Yes. Um, we, Amy mentioned a few moments ago, the importance of outreach teams. And Shelley, of course, mentioned the importance of being culturally aware and, or, and sensitive to uh, the cultural norms uh, and, and um, principles of our various communities and also the breakdown, it's you versus us or you versus them or me versus them. Uh, if there was one action item or best practice that you think every community needs to know in addressing the topic, what would it be? Would it be in fact 
culturally sensitive and effective outreach teams? Or would you add, perhaps as you're thinking about number one, best practice, and I think yesterday someone wanted to do two, which is okay. We can mention two. Uh, what would they be? What would you recommend? It's Cindy, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll start with that because one of the best practices that we've seen from the housing side is um, service providers that engage persons with lived experience. So, um, you know, depending on which special population they're serving, they have been homeless, they have been substance use, they've had substance use disorders, they're recovering from, you know, other things that the same folks are suffering from, especially, you know, veterans with um, survivors of sex trafficking, very, um, very traumatic experiences that folks have had, they do not connect with an average person generally that's doing outreach. They, they connect very quickly and easily with somebody who's been there. They, they establish trust quicker. Um, they, can, they can just you know uh, communicate on the same level, use the same terminology, same lived experiences. So that combined with you know, trauma-informed training that they've had and harm reduction policies, where they're actually just meeting people where they are um, you know, and, and not trying to fix them immediately. Um, you know, Amy talked yesterday about outreach teams having to speak to people you know, five and six times before they're willing to come in for services. You know, and that's, um, that's something that you know, we're seeing all over the, the state. Um, and, um, but best practice is definitely uh, engaging staff to do this work that has lived experience. Shelly, and then Amy, and then I will ask Aaron a question as well. Shelly, go ahead. Sure. Yes, we. I know we'd all like to talk on this one, and and engaging in in peers is uh, something we absolutely advocate for, um, and specifically related to mental health services through the Access um, Service Delivery Program. However, what I wanted to mention, and I thought Cindy actually was going to, so thanks for leaving it for me, Cindy, is really the concept of collective impact. So we really believe that the of the best practice. Um, in trying to address homelessness um, and, and housing insecurity is this concept of collective impact. And, you know, I, I like to kind of think of it as where just we bring the best and the brightest of each um, organization that plays some role. And, and we know, and to, to use a kind of a trite statement, right, it takes a village. We know that um, issues are incredibly complex we know that there is no way to get somebody who, somebody or some organization that is expert in all aspects of complex issues. And we certainly knows, know that homelessness is a complex issue. So when you bring, just as a quick example with homelessness, if you bring together those who are experts in housing, like Arizona Department of Housing, when you bring in representatives of the local community, whether it's the county government, um, uh, any county related groups, provider associations, what have you, um, community organizations, and then the Medicaid agency, and why does the Medicaid agency, and, and possibly local health community as well. And why does the Medicaid agency play such a significant role? And that's because we fund and provide and contract for and build a network for wraparound services. And wraparound mm -hmm. services are the supports that we provide to members to help keep them housed and to stop the flow to homelessness and housing insecurity. And so bringing all of those parties together to collectively work on solutions that are appropriate for each unique community is what we believe to be that best practice. Sure. Uh, uh, Shelly, thanks. Amy, and then I'm gonna pick on Aaron again. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, thanks, and just yes, agreed to, to, um, to all of the above. Um, housing with wraparound services is critical. We find that a housing first approach helps people to stabilize more quickly, more successfully from substance use issues, from mental health issues. The other one that I'd like to offer though um, is racial equity. So when we analyze our local research, we find that black people are overrepresented in the homeless population, four times their share of the general population. Native Americans are overrepresented twice their share in the general population compared to the, the, the homeless population. So we know that there are elements to our system while maybe very well intentioned are, are, are racist. They're, um, they're, they're not serving all people in an equitable way. And we need to ensure that all people have the opportunity to receive equal benefit from our systems and that no community or no population 
um, shoulders a disproportionate share of that burden from uh, as a result of that system. And so we need to apply that racial equity lens to everything that we're doing right now, because otherwise we'll unknowingly be perpetuating those elements that are not serving people in the equitable way that we would want them to be. Um, Aaron, uh, Cindy mentioned the importance of engaging people who are assisting with lived experiences, peer, peer support. Has that been your experience in working with the uh, members of the public who participate in veterans court, mental health court? Yes, peer support is uh, such an important um, component of the wraparound services. And for our uh, veteran, our veterans that are in our veterans treatment court, they're actually paired with a veteran mentor. So someone who has been uh, in the armed forces. Um, and then for mental health court, they have uh, peer services and um, they, they, they are um, someone who has been there, done that, and can you know, help walk them and guide them. And one area that I was thinking about for best practices, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about wraparound services, mm -hmm. um, but I have seen um, a disconnect with the communication from agency to agency. And I think it would be really beneficial if we had one database that shared all the information. So anyone who is um, you know, working for a specific agency, they have access to uh, that same information that housing has and that the medication assistance program has, uh, because that's where things can really fall through the cracks. Now, I believe that uh, the, the importance of a shared database this panel discussed this yesterday, and I seem to recall because it's very interesting. I had not, I personally had not appreciated that a database in this area would be so important. Uh, I, th as I recall, there was there's some initiatives that are going on. Would uh, Amy, you're you're nodding your head, and maybe you could address what's happening with the shared database and what and what you're seeing. Great, thank you. And actually, um, Shelley might be able to to address this well, as well. I know that you yeah, mentioned yeah. it yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. But we've been working with them to develop um, a shared database from the continuums of care. So, so Cindy's involved in this as well um, by virtue of staffing the, the, the balance of state for the continuum of care. The Maricopa Regional Continuum of Care has been participating in this effort, and we're very thankful to receive a grant to be able to knit together the three homeless management information systems that, that will cover them the entire state. Because the more that we can share data, the better we can deliver service. Shelly, do you have anything Shelley to add? Shelly or Cindy, anything to add? Yeah, I think one of the things I might have talked about yesterday was um, that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a locally funded initiative is working to create a data warehouse between access and the three state homeless management information systems to better coordinate homelessness and behavioral health system data. The other, the, I mentioned two other things um, that are I guess probably a little less on the homelessness side, but about sharing information. Um, and that would be the closed loop referral system that Access and the um, Health Information Exchange Contexture have been working to stand up in the state of Arizona. And so this, this goes back to, we didn't, we didn't really talk so much yet today about social determinants of health, but this refers back more to the bigger picture of social determinants and how they affect people's health and their, their health outcomes, where homelessness is one of those social determinants and obviously very important and critical one. Mm -hmm. There are actually many others, food insecurity, transportation problems, social isolation, numerous um, lack of green space, lack of fresh foods. Um, a closed loop referral system uh, is when a um, when a person goes to their practitioner's office through the through their discussion, it's determined. Let's say that this person has a social um, uh, determinant of health issue. Maybe it's a food insecurity. The practitioner refers the member to let's say a local food bank, and then they say goodbye. Thank you for for coming to have your service today. In a closed loop referral system, that practitioner you know, enters the patient's name into this referral uh, database. 
that triggers a, um, a, a referral to a food, a local community food bank. The local community food bank can pick up that referral, um, work with that patient to fulfill their need, in this case, a food, let's say food, then they um, enter that information back into the closed loop referral system, which sends the information back to the provider so that the provider knows that that loop was closed. And if the loop is not closed, then that provider can follow up with that patient at least the next time they see that patient. So that's another type of communication system. Mm -hmm. And a third thing I'll mention, um, again, probably a little less with homelessness, at least from my, not my knowledge, is just the health information exchange in general. Um, so contexture. <clears throat> um, to the extent that more and more providers and practitioners participate in the statewide health information exchange and provide, uh, submit their data um, about the member, then the next provider who is seeing member patient, then the next provider who is seeing that patient can pick up information off of the, of the HIE that maybe they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. That can include um, diagnosis codes that represent social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. There are a series of codes, we call them Z codes, that can recognize homelessness, food insecurity, domestic violence, um, abuse, all kinds of social codes. And if the practitioners um, include those in the medical record and then upload that information into the health information exchange, then it can be picked up by other practitioners who can try to work to um, resolve those issues. I'll stop there. Um, on the social determinants of health, uh, I'm going to ask Alex to uh, put into the uh, chat room the link to our Arizona Town Hall background report and also recommendations uh, from last year. Our topic, well, it was through all of last year, then the year before, was creating vibrant communities, which was essentially a summary of an analysis in Arizona of the various aspects of the social determinants of health, which range, as Shelley was mentioning, we have food insecurity, uh, adequate health care, environmental issues, transportation or lack thereof. And uh, we talk about these intersection of these factors. And depending on which source you use for the social determinants of health, there can be 14 or slightly more. But this is a report that goes into each factor that comprises the social dynamics of a vibrant community, which is, in fact, the social determinants of health. Let me raise a, a point uh, that the build on what Amy said, or um, the follow up on one of Amy's points, is removing the us versus them barrier. I know that when I uh, drive down the street, and I live in Sunny Slope, and we have a number of parks, and I will see homeless encampments. Uh, they may not be very large, but there are two or three people, and sometimes they're larger. And then I will read in the newspaper about how services are offered to some folks, but they don't want to, uh, they don't want to use them because they either don't trust the provider or they've had their few personal effects thrown out, and they're just not, they just don't want to participate in care. And my concern is that a number of people in the public, because I've had people say this to me, well, they don't want the services. This is exactly what Amy was saying. How do we as individuals who, who have educated ourselves about these issues, how do we talk to people who say, well, look, just let them be. It's their problem. That's their choice. It's not my, it's not my problem. Is there any tips on this? on how I as an individual or those among the room can address this with folks. Amy? You know, I've had this conversation a number of times <laughs> with- I um, bet you have. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it, and I think it's important to start where people are. And that includes people experiencing homelessness as well as people in the community who may be of the position that, that, that you just mentioned. You have to start where people are. And I think it's important to, um, acknowledge that it does, be, it does take time sometimes to bring someone into service, but then to talk about the reasons why. And I mean, things like if they're required to be clean and sober, 
and they're just not, then they can't enter that service. So in essence, they aren't eligible for that bed that's being offered to them. Um, it could also be if they are traveling with a partner, you know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Okay. Most of the time they can't enter shelter with that loved one. And so it means having to separate from them. For some people, and this may seem trivial to some, but it's definitely not trivial to those experiencing it. They can't enter shelter often with their pet. Yeah. And it may seem trivial, like, oh, it's just a dog. <laughs> but when everyone else in your life has turned their back on you and the only living being that is still by your side is that pet, there's no way that you're going to leave that pet behind. <laughs> and so there are, you know, and then too, like with the gross, you know, the stereotypical grocery cart. Well, I, I can't enter with all my belongings, but that's the only thing that they have in this world. That's it. They've lost everything else. So when you break it down like that and try, try to appeal to Okay, maybe you haven't experienced homelessness, but have you ever experienced loneliness? Have you ever experienced isolation? Have you ever lost someone that, that, that you really loved or something that, that you really loved? Once you can scale it down to those base feelings, I think people can, can relate better. Um, but it's getting down to what's that essential human emotion that we can all relate to and then invoke that in the person that you're having the conversation with. Amy, very helpful. On this point, and I, we may well have addressed it with Amy's comments, um, the role of nimbyism. I mean, uh, I always think of that as more of a property issue, which is not, not in my backyard. I don't want the service provider down the street or uh, next to the city park. Um, but we see it all the time. Uh, it, what role does nimbyism play? In preventing constructive solutions, question one. Question two is, well, what's the best way to address it? Well, I'm happy Shelly. to start maybe with number two by providing an example. Um, so I, I think the way, <clears throat> one of the ways we can address it uh, goes right back to that, that community involvement that we were talking mm -hmm. about before is making sure that we are listening to community members to understand what their concerns mm -hmm. are and come up with constructive ways to address them. And so I provide an example about a, um, a behavioral health provider who uh, actually was in the Sunny Slope neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, there were many, many concerns raised by constituents and, and, and the legislators in that area. And, um, you know, when we, we, we started an open dialogue and this became very much an access issue. Um, mm -hmm. And we had an, a very, an open dialogue. We actually, um, access representatives attend community meetings for this group. Um, so we, we really make sure our presence is, is known and that we are available. And we've worked with the community group in this one instance, for example, where one of the concerns was the lineup of cars down a major thoroughfare. Those cars were waiting to pick up our members to, to leave the facility and then also the cars dropping off. So we worked with the provider to establish, um, in fact, mandated, that the provider established a different traffic flow, a traffic yeah. flow that would work from the back of the building that would force the cars into this parking lot and around the back so that they couldn't stop traffic going down the street. Um, we, we required provider, this provider and I believe all providers um, in this similar situation to provide us with security plans that we mm -hmm. can share with community members. So those are just a couple of examples of ways we can be sensitive to and collaborate with community groups, hear exactly what the concerns are and work to address them so that we can have providers in hot spots, in areas where we know uh, we need to bring the services to our members. Cindy. Yeah, Pat, so, um, you know, NIMBYism affects all, all kinds of zoning cases, affordable housing, even just normal multifamily housing, you know, people are afraid of apartments and things like that. And, you know, Shelly hit on the, the best way to get around that as a, as a developer or a service provider coming into a community, you need to meet with that community and you need to meet with them multiple times and you need to um, understand their concerns and have answers for that and be willing to make um, 
adaption to your facility, whatever it is, if it's a closed facility 24 seven, um, you know, that people won't be standing around uh, wandering through the neighborhood waiting for your services and things like that, just like Shelly said, traffic issues, things like that. Another thing that we've seen great success with is bringing in potential residents. So you have a wait list for affordable housing generally. You bring in some of those single moms with their children and have them tell their story. Um, you know, I fled domestic violence. I am a single mom. I work at this job. I have two kids and I just need this housing. And this is the only housing I can afford. Um, it's really hard for the community to argue against that. And they have a better understanding of like who's going into that housing and how much good it's going to do. So that's what I've observed over the years. Cindy and uh, Shelley, thank you. Um, we have a question from one of our um, uh, participants. And this goes back to your comments about the shared database and the closed loop referral system. And I'm, I'm not sure you can answer this, but let me raise it. Do, e do either the shared database or the closed loop referral system pose a potential violation to protecting individual personal information, such as um, the healthcare provider uh, puts into the database the diagnostic code that that particular uh, physician PA uses. Uh, does that raise an issue about pers uh, privacy? You know, um, we have lots of folks at Access and at Contextor who could answer this question and tell you the reasons and the manners and way we're able to do this mm -hmm. properly, respecting HIPAA privacy mm -hmm. and protection okay. laws, respecting, I think it's called, um, let's see, we've got a couple of court folks here. Is it section two, article two? I can't recall the right term, but that's the um, substance use uh, mm -hmm. laws. Um, we follow all of those but I can't speak to the details on that. So um, there, there is a way to protect individual yes. privacy. Uh, and it's just, we need that. We don't have the, perhaps the, the real privacy expert when it comes to doing that here on the, around the table, but there's a way to do it. Amy, you're exactly. I can't well. recall if it, I can't recall if it starts from the, the patient signing consent for okay. their data to be shared, which is probably the right one of the right answers. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't, it's a compli again, a complicated issue. And so um, all those, all privacy laws, regulations, and consent are adhered to in all of these tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy? Absolutely. I know that that's been a high priority for, um, from the perspective of the continuum of care as well. We've worked really hard over the years. I mean, I was part of the original team years and years ago that launched our first homeless management information system. It was called something different then. And um, initially I was very resistant to putting data in, even though I was required to I'm like, well, I need to protect my clients. You know, because that's instilled in us, I, like we have to protect the confidentiality, the privacy of our clients. And we've come a long way since then. We're able to share data in a safe way that protects their confidentiality and their privacy, but facilitates better service delivery as well. And so we're keeping all of those concerns very much at the forefront and we've been able to mitigate any concerns there. Right. Okay. So the answer to your question, sir, or ma'am, is that in fact, there is a way to maintain and protect individual personal information. Uh, let's, I wanna go back to a concept that Cindy mentioned, which was collective impact. And one of the uh, points that came up over and over again in our discussions on creating vibrant communities was that we have so many entities, groups, nonprofits with wonderful programs and they're kind of siloed and they work separately. And wouldn't it be great if we could get them to work together for collective impact? And the, we, we engaged probably about, I don't know, four or 5,000 Arizonans on last year's topic. And we, I can't say we came up with, here's, here's the magic way to do that. Uh, I do know, I do remember that um, I think it was uh, some of you will know Gwen Calhoun, who was on the city council in uh, Santa Cruz, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, in the in, uh, out there um, in Lake um, Sierra I guess Vista. The mine goes. Thanks, Tara. When you hit 70, the mine goes. But any of us, many of you will know her. She was explaining that some of the nonprofits in the southern part of the state, when they provide grant money, they require the uh, 
the recipient of grant money to engage two other nonprofits in doing a coordinated effort, which I thought was a very creative way to have some collective impact. But from your perspective, do you have any thoughts on how to encourage or incentivize collective impact with groups working together on these issues? Cindy. Yeah, so I'll start. So <clears throat> Director Simplot and I started at um, the Department of Housing just last year, last mm -hmm. summer. And um, one of the first things we wanted to do was hear from the community and talk to the community about what's going on and started doing round tables and bringing homeless service providers <clears throat> excuse me, housing providers together to, to first figure out what was going on, where should, we, where should we put our funding, what funding should we ask for, things like that. But what we found over time, especially in the homeless to housing roundtable, was that people just were actually having a, a, a venue to talk to each other and figure out what was going on with the downtown campus versus what's going on in Tucson, what's going on in Mesa. And the agencies were able to make referrals or contacts after our roundtable. They asked for contact information because I have a couple of beds over here or I have a bed over there and maybe we can refer to each other. So I think we need to create those opportunities to collaborate like the roundtables that Director Simpa created. Those are ongoing and continuous. I know MAG, Maricopa Association of Governments, is really helping us. We're trying to uh, bring homeless youth providers together in Maricopa County uh, because we lost all of our shelter beds. We lost a lot of um, drop-in centers, outreach specific to youth during COVID, right before COVID. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to bring that back together. So they have a monthly meeting of all the homeless youth providers. And now that we're all talking together, we're starting to coordinate services, make referrals to each other and work better together. So I think we need that opportunity. Um, somebody needs to take the lead and just bring everybody together and they're willing to work with each other. Yeah. In the chat room, one of our participants wrote on this point, housing all support services under one roof Portland has done this. Uh, many, most of these people cannot go agency to agency, so they're all in one, the agencies are all together. Their clientele can come one-stop shopping, and then they, the agencies, since they're all together, they can speak to each other, which is the point that Cindy was making. Amy? No, I think that's a great point, and I, mean, I think funders in particular really can play an instrumental role in this. So for example, working on a nonprofit, you have to develop reports and they need to be accurate and, and be done in a timely way, but every report's a little bit different. If the funders could, and some are, coordinate on the types of data that, that are being requested, even to have a common reporting forum, a common reporting database, something like that would be incredibly helpful. And that's happening in some areas, but not all. Um, that would help the nonprofits because then they wouldn't have to develop individual reports for every single different funder in a slightly different way. It also helps the funders because then they are in a better position then to assess that, that, that collective impact because they have a common way to define the measure of success and they can um, analyze that on a more aggregate basis. So I think something like that could be really helpful as well. It's critically important to be able to share data, to be able to share funding um, and we're doing a lot more of that during, during the pandemic. <laughs> those were lessons that were kind of forced on us in a sense. Um, but I just hope that we don't forget those lessons, you know, because we, we work together a lot better because we had to, because of the crisis, because of the sense of urgency. And even after hopefully the pandemic dissipates, a sense of urgency wanes, we still need to be working together better because it's just more effective. Okay. Any other thoughts on, on this? On this? in creating collective impact? I, I would say that, I would, or I would add that we've really seen some really recent successes over the last few years regarding collaboration and working together. Um, for example, the governor's office has brought together um, various state agencies to work together on these solutions. So the Department of Housing Access, Department of Economic Security, the Department of Corrections, um, we all, again, it's, it's back to that earlier comment I made about we all have a piece of the puzzle. Um, we're all working together on homelessness and housing strategies. Again, where we all bring our, our piece. Um, so Department of Housing with their expertise on obviously the housing side of it, access with those wraparound services. We have very significant work and initiatives with the corrections populations, mm -hmm. um, various in-reach activities to seek out 
uh, folks before they're released to ensure we know what their conditions are. We get them um, uh, assigned to a provider upon release, determine where they're gonna be housed if we can. Um, so just all working together. And I, I think the governor's office has really led uh, quite effectively in this area. You know, that's a, a, a thank you for raising that because the uh, and we also have a town hall report on criminal justice in Arizona. But we know, for example, that uh, uh, people who have been incarcerated that have served their time in the lingo, in the vernacular, where do they go when they're released? They go back to their communities. And and if they don't have support services housing principally what's going to happen well that is why arizona has one of the highest recidivism rates in the united states approximately 40% of those released from prison re-enter prison within 3 years and uh, we have not really advanced the ball uh, and that was up until a, a couple years back. But with programs for housing services, I mean, if you haven't gone out and held a job in four or five years, it's a new world out there. You may not have a driver's license. You probably don't actually. You may not have applied for a social security card. Uh, how do you prepare a resume? How do you how do you survive in the community? And that is a major part of the population. And indeed, most every Arizonan has a family member or a friend or a friend of a family member who has been involved in the criminal justice system. So working with our formerly incarcerated um, uh, citizens and um, population is just really important. Any other thoughts on working with the formerly incarcerated? Any other? I know that you're right, DLC has really been working on this quite a bit in the last few years. Yes, Shelley. Yeah, I mean, truthfully, we could do a town hall just on what access does with the criminal justice population. Oh, absolutely. And, but I'll, I'll focus today really um, more on the mental health and housing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great opportunity for me to tell you about um, a request we submitted to the federal government, CMS. Uh, it's called a waiver. That's just yeah. the, the vehicle mm -hmm. of the request. Mm -hmm. So access has about $30 million in state appropriated funds that we use for our housing efforts, which is actually really a tremendous amount of money um, for, from the state to the Medicaid agency for this purpose, um, especially when you look at other Medicaid agencies. If we, if we were able to get permission from the federal government to get the federal government to start picking in federal funds, which is how the rest of Medicaid services are funded, we could draw down $60 million in federal funds added to our 30 million in state funds for a collective $90 million. You can only imagine what we could do with our programming efforts if we could triple from 30 to 90 million. One of the target, pop I should mention this is called our Housing and Healthcare Opportunities, I believe it is waiver or H2O. Um, one of our target populations in the H2O waiver is the formerly incarcerated. So what our goal is, we are looking for housing, transitional housing, so bridge to permanency, not homeless sheltering, for members with a serious mental illness. And one of those target populations are those who will be released from jails and prisons. So it goes right back to what I was talking about just a few minutes ago, where we would identify through in-reach efforts up to 30 days before a member is to be released from prison or jail, we would identify those with a serious mental illness who have a housing need and we would look to be able to place one of these members or house one of these members in a transitional housing facility where we would then wrap significant services around those members, like you were just talking about, Pat, including all kinds of life skills training, um, how to grocery shop how to take the bus, how to uh, write a resume, all kinds of um, activities, including healthcare activities, of course, to help reduce recidivism. 
And Pat. Oh, oh Cindy, know, please go ahead. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse all the coughing this morning. I'm having allergy issues. But um, aren't we all? <laughs> yes. Spring. Um, we have two contracts for reentry housing with a new leaf and St. Joseph, the worker, mm -hmm. and those contracts mm -hmm. focus on mm -hmm. um, a connection to employment as well as life skills training and, and support wraparound support mm -hmm. um, for before leaving prison, actually some of the training and things like that, working in conjunction with DOC on their training before leaving prison and then coming out. Um, and both of them are you know, really focused on employment because without a job and something to do every day, it's really hard to stay housed and stay um, with it, I guess, and just, and, and not revert mm -hmm. back and, and, and go back to jail, go you know, back to what you're used to. Um, but also, um, you know, we try to work with our service providers and our partners like access, you know, on referrals to other programs, but if they have a condition like a seriously mental illness, we can we refer them to that kind of housing and then back to us once they're either recovered or ready to have normal housing or regular housing for, for people without issues. And I know the DOC just issued a, um, like a, a proposal or RFP out there for substance abuse uh, recovery mm -hmm. housing. I think it's a 90 day treatment center. So coming out of prison, you can go to this treatment center for 90 days. We've been talking to some of the service providers about how to, how to provide housing after that, after the 90 days, where's the transitional housing and then what kind of permanent housing after that. So we try to work with the ser service providers to accommodate, you know, wherever they are in serving persons coming out of prison. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We have a few more minutes left, and I'm going to ask you a question that actually has, with a visual aid, if anyone can see it, it is two sides of a coin. This is a 1922 peace dollar, and it has on the side Lady Liberty on one side, and the peace dove on the other side. I happen to be a coin collector, and the peace dove was, of course, after World War I. And so on the side of the coin that reflects lack of resources. If you had no more money or really, really tight, limited financial resources, I mean, think about the days of the Great Depression or frankly, more recently, the Great Recession. What is the one action you would take that you believe would be most effective in addressing homelessness, be created by or caused by substance use and mental health issues. Again, this is where we have no more money. What would you do? Well, what would you recommend? Shelly, thanks. At the risk of repeating, it goes back to the collab, the, um, the, God, I just lost the words, <laughs> the collaborative, um, collective relationships impact. and the collective yeah. impact. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, braiding together, um, braiding together funding, because maybe you don't have enough, but maybe you have a piece, and maybe another organization yeah. has a piece. Um, bringing the parties together and um, collectively trying to solve the solution with what each can bring to the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amy's nodding. Cindy. Yeah, I would also say in addition to that is just advocacy and pushing, pushing people to make things happen, being a leader in bringing people together. Um, it takes folks like that to, to make things happen. You have to be out yeah. there willing to put yourself out and advocate. And anybody can do that in your neighborhood, in your community, um, but also we who are you know, leaders in, in housing and in healthcare and in services, we need to be out there advocating all the time. We can do that without any money and we can make things happen. Absolutely. Now, oh, yes, Aaron, thank you. I would look at what each agency is doing and ask myself, what can we do better? Um, and so how can we identify them? Whether it's um, a police who has interaction, you know, with a, a homeless person, you know, they, they can write on the referral, homeless person, you know, and or if they're identified in the jail as homeless, identify there homeless, and then we can start using the services uh, that we have to outreach to them. I think um, there are things that we can do um, differently um, to help identify these, uh, this population that doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. And I agree with everything that's been said and underlying all of this, I think is, I would love to inspire more a sense of that we're all neighbors that nobody is disposable, everybody has value, everybody can add value. 
to this. And if we approach every endeavor with that frame set, with, with, with that frame of mind, I think we'll be better able to collaborate with each other and to see opportunities that maybe um, weren't as apparent before. Yeah. You know, I should have asked that question last because now I was going to ask about it. Suppose you have billions of these things and we have now an abundance of resources. What action would you take to address the topic? I mean, what we've just discussed is so important, no matter how many resources we have. Uh, but if you did have just an overabundance or an abundance of resources, is there one action you would take to address the topic? Amy. I would say safe, safe, affordable housing for all people. Housing mm -hmm. is foundational to everything else, recovering from mental mm -hmm. health issues, recovering from substance use issues, and we need more of it. We, we lose more and more of it every day. And so yeah. I would say safe, affordable yeah. housing for all people. Yeah. Shelly. Very similar. Yes. Housing capacity, um, making more housing available. Gosh, in this market we're in right now, it's just a, a, a worsening and an exacerbating mm -hmm. of, of all the problems and um, uh, landlords, owners who, who won't even take the vouchers. We have plenty mm -hmm. of rental vouchers, but not um, plenty of uh, folks who will take them and not take them at the current value um, and uh, just not enough buildings. I, I think Cindy's got comments on that too. Not to put you I mean, everybody's, spot. yeah, everybody wants the same thing, right? More housing. I think if I had all the money in the world, I would convert every giant vacant, you know, office building and Kmart or whatever is, you know, <laughs> vacant out there, those big box stores into housing as well and add, you know, our, our cities need to, take those old, you know, zombie strip malls that we see everywhere, you know, and, and put housing on that, even if it's, you know, a row of townhouses that people can afford. Um, we need every type of housing, but especially we need housing that is affordable for people with very extremely low income. We've lost that housing yeah. over the years. Yeah. We used to have boarding houses. We used to have a lot more public housing. We used to have mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, alternatives for people who even elderly on social security, if you're making $19,000 a year on social security, you can only afford to rent a room. We should be able to provide that somewhere where you can go rent a room and then you can still buy food and pay for your health care and have quality living conditions. All of that has. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our presentation today. I do not see any open questions. Um, uh, uh, we have a um, announcement in the chat room about Morrison is co-hosting a program in Yuma next week. Uh, the story of affordable housing in Yuma. So that will segue into what we have just discussed. So in the time remaining, I would like to turn this back to Evelyn, and then we will be ending on time, if not before. So let me warn you speakers, and you other speakers, we will finish up on time. So with that said, Evelyn, thank you. And I want to say, panelists, you are fabulous. This was such an engaged discussion. And Shelley Mellon, thank you for putting this together. And the um, Southwest Arizona Town Hall, thank you for the opportunity. Great, Pat, thank you so much. Our panelists and Morrison Institute, I hope those of you who have been tuning in this morning are inspired to to, to, to move to the next step. And that is having those uh, conversations um, amongst yourselves and with uh, some town hall community town halls coming up. So um, we've got a couple more things before, before we close today. Uh, special thanks and once again to Southwest Arizona Town Hall hosting the event and to our financial sponsor for these launch events. As I mentioned, we did one in uh, Phoenix yesterday. We have this one with you all today and we're um, going to be uh, launching again with a similar program in Flagstaff later on this month. So the, the sponsor of our launch events has been Giesel Law Firm, which includes a member of the research committee who helped create the background report. So I'm going to call for some brief comments. Holly Giesel, Holly, if you could just say a few words and um, I'm gonna be calling on Shelly and then close right after that. Well, good morning. Thank you all for attending. Uh, it is really an honor for me to be able to, to uh, help sponsor this uh, year's town hall event and the launch in particular. Uh, 
I, my, my law firm, my practice is um, a practice that includes uh, both criminal law with an emphasis in uh, representation of individuals with uh, mental illness, often one of the diagnoses that qualifies them for eligibility as seriously mentally ill. And then on the civil side, we do a lot of civil rights work on behalf of individuals in jails and prisons and in the uh, behavioral health system whose civil rights are not honored. Uh, and we will litigate those issues in our civil rights practice. And then we also represent providers in the system uh, who uh, have different regulatory administrative issues raising, ranging from say a professional's issue with the licensing board, a doctor, a nurse, a psychologist, or an entity's issue, uh, perhaps with access involving issues, uh, alleged fraud. So we have a broad-based practice, but it's not the professional issues that brought me to town hall. It was a long uh, standing interest in this forum. I, it is a remarkably unique and important part of our community, in my opinion, because it's a way that we come together as a large group, hundreds of people, and we spend our time in, in sessions where we are focused on listening, thinking, and discussing topics in a way that is focused on reaching a consensus about a, a definition, an approach, possible solutions. We don't do that much in life, particularly if we're lawyers, right? Or even if we're regulators, because we're always taking a position. I think I joke and say, if I had done town hall as a young woman, I would have been a better lawyer. I would have been a better mother, a better spouse. Um, so I do think it is incredibly unique and powerful and empowering to individuals and to community. So I am honored to be a part of it. Um, I, I came personally to the interest in mental health and made a choice to orient my practice over time toward helping individuals with mental health issues. Our slogan on our logo is committed representation because I made a personal commitment to orient my professional practice uh, in, in this arena, these arenas. It arose out of the near death of one of our four children in our house, in a closet, and but for the fact that due to mental illness, but for the fact that my husband was a physician and my son, oldest son was there and he was a Navy SEAL uh, with tons of combat experience, um, she, our child would have died. And uh, she, at that point, the, uh, our child was a minor. So she did not qualify as SMI. You can't be SMI until you're an adult, 18. And the child also proved eventually not to have uh, as an illness that qualified for SMI or to the debt degree. But it took years, an enormous amount of money, uh, five figure checks a month for years. But that our child came out the other end with love and science and, and resources and a wonderful system at UCLA and Johns Hopkins and so on. She came out the other end and is fabulously successful in her 30s. Um, we were blessed and we were grateful. And so I made the decision uh, to help others. And I, I say I do this and this is the this is the motivation that I have. I do this for mothers who take two buses to get their children help. And uh, transportation in addition to housing is something we ought to talk about because it's key. But so that's why I do it. I am honored to do it and will continue to do it as long as I can. I hope all of you will join the town hall in your community. I'm so grateful to the Holly Foundation for letting, for the money that's gonna take this to the communities. I participated in town halls in the criminal justice area, which Judge Norris mentioned in several prisons. And it was 
it was life changing for those uh, for those participants. So thank you, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful, blessed weekend, and be safe. Thank you. All right. Holly, thank you for your generosity of your time and your resources, and I will be seeing you again soon, I'm sure. So before I close, I'd like to also call on Shelly Mellon again to highlight some upcoming events um, in Southwest at the Southwest uh, Town Hall. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you for that amazing um, uh, sharing your, your life's journey with us. That, that was really touching in for all you're doing. So thank you so much. I also want to thank Arizona Town Hall again, Morrison Institute, the sponsors and the panelists. I, these were excellent discussions and I, it's really building the foundation um, for the launch for our community, for our upcoming forums and town halls. And, and it, I appreciate everyone that participated. I got to see who was um, listed there and we had, we have so many um, experts and providers that were all, all, that joined us today. And we really want to encourage you to attend the upcoming Southwest Arizona Town Hall Foundational Forums. So I will list those off one more time. We need, we need your insight and your um, ideas to be able to, to tackle this all together. So May 20th is the Virtual Mental Health Forum in partnership with Yuma Regional Medical Center. June 10th is the Virtual Substance Use Forum in partnership with the Yuma County Anti-Drug Coalition and Drug-Free Communities. And then we wrap up all three topics, um, mental health, substance use, and homelessness in our fall, September 30th town hall. So put those on your calendar and we look forward to furthering these discussions. Thank you. All right, Shelly, appreciate that. Um, for, for all that you're doing down in Southwest Arizona. So just three things, a quick, very quick items before we close. So Arizona Town Hall and Arizonans like you all out there will make a difference as, as we're all saying uh, that collective impact, and especially in, it was I'm saying as an, as an individual, uh, we all will make uh, a, a difference here in these local and statewide gatherings. And the, these community town halls uh, aim to educate even people who don't know anything about what we're talking about here, the public, about those challenges associated with, with mental health, substance use, and homelessness, and, and hopefully to catalyze the solutions that work for our diverse Arizona communities. So the second thing, this event has been recorded and the video will be posted to the Arizona Town Hall YouTube channel uh, for your refresher, or if you wanna share it with other folks to get them inspired to participate. And lastly, just contact us at Arizona Town Hall or even uh, Shelly down in, uh, Oh, and with the, the report that Pat is showing us on the screen there, you have access to that online. So please use that as a tool and uh, contacting uh, any of us to arrange for a community or a future leader town hall, which focuses on our young folks uh, in your area. Um, we are so appreciative once again to the Holly Foundation to support that because we're going to be able to touch more people with this topic. So to, to um, we'll just say thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you at a future event and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs>